from the nation's capital, this is the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast with your host, Rob Snowett. This is episode 253 of the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. My name is Rob Snow White, and this episode was recorded live at the Tailwaters Lodge in Altmart, New York in November of 2019. I bumped into Pete Kutzer a couple of days before at the bar at the Tailwaters Lodge, and we decided to schedule a sit-down interview sometime that week. It turned out the only time we could both talk was late night on Thursday after a long week of fishing. We're both fairly tired. I'm probably more tired than Pete. In this episode, we're going to discuss tall guy problems, intricate versus basic flies, the start of Peter's employment at Orvis and how he became the online casting instructor, how to grip a rod, different rod actions, some roll casting and travel hacks, double hauling. We're going to discuss heights and tomatoes, but not together at the same time. And we're going to retire the Harrison Ford movie question. This episode is brought to you by Black Diamond Equipment, blackdiamondequipment.com. Black Diamond is all about climbing and skiing. They share the same experiences that you do on rock, ice, and snow, and these experiences push them to make the best gear possible for their worldwide family of climbers and skiers. Black Diamond began in 1957 with a backyard anvil and a hammer and has now grown into a global company with offices on three continents. They are a company that's not just for rock climbers and skiers. We can add fly fishermen and fly anglers into this as well. The company today is more committed than ever, thanks to the many people here in the U.S. and at Black Diamond Europe, whose limitless energy and hands-on involvement have created a promising future for all climbers, skiers, and fly anglers worldwide. I'm a big fan of Black Diamond Equipment headlamps. I'm not a skier. I'm not a climber. I've been using their headlamps for over 20 years now. I'm a big fan of the Moji Lantern. It's great for hanging on the tree branches in the early morning when you're setting up your gear before the crowds arrive. I'm also a big fan of using it here in the house when the power goes out, and I hang it from inside the Xterra to illuminate the inside of my vehicle before I go to sleep when I'm car camping at night. I'm currently using the Storm 375 waterproof headlamp. Keeps your batteries dry if it goes for a sink. It has three options of bright light, LED light, and then red light if you don't want to hurt the eyes and the fish around you when you're walking around the shoreline in the morning. It also has a strobe in case someone needs to find you. If you are looking for ideas to stuff your stockings or to get your stockings stuffed, so to speak, Please ask for the Moji headlamp or the Storm 375. Now let's talk to Pete at the Tailwaters Lodge in Altmar, New York. That's right. So we got Pete Kutzer. We're at randomly <laughs> at the Tailwater Lodge in Altmar, New York. And what brings you up to the lodge this week? So I'm up here uh, doing a steelhead school. So each, uh, each year in the fall this time of year, we... Uh, uh, work with the folks here at Tailwater, uh, Brian Benner, Matt Ertzinger, um, the head guide, and the guy in charge of the fishing department. We kind of work together on setting up this school. And so we do a school kind of focusing on steelhead fishing, different techniques and tactics to kind of target steelhead fishing. We stay at the lodge, eat at the lodge, and then we uh, do a couple days of guided fishing after uh, our fishing school day. Randomly, my client Josh just happened to be here with you. Yep. Yep. So, so you took. Uh, so Josh was uh, part of our school, but Josh was a client of yours. Uh, yeah. You took Josh fishing, and, and he told me awesome things. He said something about catching this really large bass off of a bridge. Right. Something like that. Sounds like a pretty cool story. That's about as urban fishing as you're going to get. The reason we're wearing waders that day in August is because there's so much estrogen in the water. <laughs> you, well, not just estrogen. There's other pharmaceuticals because they take out. We like to say you know, corn and toilet paper, yeah. but they don't take out pharmaceuticals. So you know, every male bass in the Potomac will have eggs and ovaries in it from birth control and bovine hormones. Really? But this point source pollution is specifically human-derived pharmaceuticals. Like people just flushing their well, and, and stuff down the toilet? Whatever you excrete out goes into the water. Really? Wow. So we wear waders there regardless of if it's 98 degrees just because you don't know what's in there. 
Oh, there's all oh, sorts man. of fecal bacteria from the dog parks upstream. Oh. So we were sweating. We walked a, a, a bit that day. I fished. Uh, I fished the Harlem Mirror one time in yeah, the middle of the summer. There. And uh, and when we were up there, kind of right in Central Park, I guess. I think it's in Central Park. We're right in New York City, and there was all sorts of signs up, like "Don't get in the water, don't touch the water, don't let your dogs in the water." We had we caught some great fish though. We uh, we didn't catch any snakeheads, um, but we caught a lot of largemouth bass, uh, some big panfish, you know, pumpkin seeds, bluegills, things like that. And uh, and it was pretty cool. I mean, it, we saw some really interesting characters, which which I think is kind of comes with the urban fishing territory. Yes. Um, but it was it was a lot of fun. I mean, it was it was a great time. I hope we get to uh, get to do something like that again. You guys have to come down. I'm telling yeah. you, the May beer tie. You guys That'd should be fun. Just, you can stay at Dan's mom's house. That'd I live in fun. Dan's wife's aunt's old house. Really? Yes. Oh, jeez. So we're talking about Dan Devala, which I, I'm sure a lot of a lot of your uh, listeners and and we know very closely. I mean, he's a good friend of both of ours. I sit right next to Dan and talk to him every day, and he's uh, he's one heck of a good skateboarder. Yes. Like, he's and and he's progressing. So he's progressing in his skateboarding faster than most 15-year-olds, it seems he's like. He's got to be careful at our age, though. He's the only guy in the skate park with a helmet, wrist guards, knee pads on. I mean, he does it right. That's funny. But he is getting it's, – it's crazy. He comes in each day. You know, you would think working at Orvis, you'd be like, oh, you know, I'm really excited for my next bonefish trip. And Dan's like, no, I just landed this, you know, 50-50 grind across the half pipe. It's because kind of he's not modern. His body has yeah. atrophied from being on the internet and on a mobile phone. Yes. He can do those yeah, things. Yeah, he is not modern. That is so right. true. All right, so how did we get from you growing up on a dairy farm to working in Orvis? So I I grew up in southern Vermont. Uh, my parents uh, have a little dairy farm. We make yogurt and cheese and buttermilk and butter and, and all that stuff. And uh, I want and to talk about the cheeses too. It, well, it's it's all like a soft cheese, kind of like a borzen. Um, okay. And so it's a soft cheese, and then we add like black pepper to it, black and white pepper. We oh do a God. horseradish. We do a, you know a chive. It's called Gamble Garden Creamery. Got to do a shameless plug there. Well, I used I, to be a cheesemonger, so really, yeah, I love cheese. So do, do you like borzen, like the soft? Oh cheese? yeah, I grew up eating that. That was normal and then when you're on a budget you get the philadelphia cream cheese garlic and herb yeah which is not the same not the same yeah, borsan no. was like growing up that was normal after school that yeah. was a snack yeah, that absolutely. and uh still I mean, wheat thins oh, smeared on absolutely absolutely uh I, I mean growing up in vermont i mean we are a, a very dairy centric state I is that mean, how you're so big yes yes that is it's it's a steady diet of lots of dairy is your family as tall as you uh yeah my my father's about six three my mother she's probably five nine i don't know where six eight came from but like i was saying to you earlier i think they didn't know about like the bovine growth hormones yeah. you know when i was growing up and so Which a lot is in of the potomac it, yeah yeah if Which i wear waiters i'd be as tall as you yeah I wear them <laughs> I didn't wear waders. That's yeah. why, you know, I just just drank the milk, uh, you know, straight up. Raw How'd milk. you get into fishing? Well, um, so my father always fished, and actually, um, the first fish that I really wanted to pursue with a fly rod was actually striped bass. And so, um, so my father and I grew up fishing, or I grew up fishing with my father. Um, he uh, he's originally from Philadelphia, but he moved up to Vermont to meet my mother, um, who's from Vermont. Fell in love with the bat and kill, and so um, so. We were, um, we had a house, or well, actually, before I was born, we had a house kind of right on the Battenkill River, and we grew up there, and so we had that in the backyard. But he was a diehard striper fisherman, surf fisherman, so he, we had the truck with the rocket launchers in the front of it and a camper. We'd drive on the beaches around Cape Cod and down Rhode Island and, and stuff like that, and we would go out fishing all the time. But he would always make me drag a, a snow sled full of lawn chairs, lead weight, bait a cooler full of food and, and beer for him when I was a kid and and he would just run out in front with plugs and a surf rod and he'd catch all the fish I'd drag the sled behind him I'm like this is a hard, hard working farm kid yeah I'd be like this sucks though I'm like I want to catch these fish and so we were out there and I was probably 12 13 years old at the time and I watched this guy uh, he was catching stripers the same size stripers the sa same everything as what we were catching with surf rods but he was catching with a fly rod and he had this funny little milk crate thing bungee cord to his waist and he's he's catching the same fish and I was like well and I thought to myself I was like well if I do that 
I don't have to carry all this stuff because I don't need any of it. So I want to try that. So so I went up. There was one of these like tent sales that Orvis used to put on, and, and I missed I, those tent sales. Oh, uh, there there were there were a lot of fun. Yeah. I used to work them, so I got first dibs on packing. Yeah, <laughs> it was nice. There were some good scores in there. If if you looked I still around, have things nets. I have waders from '99 that my clients still wear. Really, original pro guides with the kind of uh, neoprene yeah. knee pad in them. Yeah, still wear them. Our new pro waders have neoprene knee pads in them. Oh my gosh! It's it. I don't know why they ever got rid of them. Yeah, they're amazing. Well, so I I went to one of these tent sales though, and I picked up a ten weight. And everybody was like, oh, you don't need a 10 weight to catch stripers. You know, use an 8 weight or a 9 weight. I'm like, well, no, I'm going to catch big stripers. You know, you know, I thought I was going to go catch the largest striper in the, in the ocean, but that was not the case. So I kept on, you know, kept at it, and I was fly fishing every time we'd go down to the beach. You know, and we'd go to, like, the North Shore of Massachusetts a lot, like an area called, like, Plum Island. And, and then, uh, you know, that kind of area. We'd go to Cape Cod. We'd go to Rhode Island a little bit. And, and I just fell in love with that. And then when I would come home, though, it was always using a spinning rod for largemouth bass. And, and I had some trout streams, you know, the batten kills nearby. And, and so we would go to the batten kill and fish spinning tackle. And I was like, well, I want to try this fly fishing thing. So actually the first trout I think I caught with a fly rod might have been on a 10 weight. Just set the hook and just launch it. Just, uh, right in the bushes behind me. It was a, like a 10 weight with an intermediate line. So then I was like, okay, I need to go get a fly rod for trout because this is kind of fun. This is cool. It was on a, uh, the first trout I ever caught was on a fly called the Professor. This was a wet fly and uh, did that and just fell, fell in love with it. And for a while, me and my friends in high school, it was always kind of fly fish for trout, spin fish for bass kind of thing. And then I kind of really gravitated towards the fly fishing side of things. So I started wanting to fly fish for bass and fly fish for pike and fly fish for anything I could. You know, I really enjoyed it. And then fast forward when I was in college, snowboarding was always a huge passion of mine. When I was in college, a good friend of mine that I snowboarded with, he said, hey, you like to fly fish. Why don't you get a job at Orvis? Well, it just so happened his dad worked at Orvis. And, uh, what year was this? This was in 2002. Well, 2001, he was telling me about it. I started at Orvis in 2002. And so went to Orvis, applied for the job, managed to get a job. It was a summer job working in the fishing schools in 2002. And then I did that for a couple of years through college. Then after I graduated college, I moved out to Oregon. I just wanted to steelhead fish and snowboard. That's all I wanted to do. Like I, I caught the steelhead bug. It's one of the reasons why I'm out here. Was crazy in love with it. It was the worst winter they ever had in Oregon. There was no El Nino. Yeah, it was like something weird happened. There was no snow in the mountains, so the mountain closed. Mount Hood Meadows closed that year. And then no runoff. And then there was no runoff, and there was no rain. It was like 80 degrees and sunny Were in the Pacific Northwest. You for bringing a drought. Well, <laughs> the tall guy. They, they, they were cursing me for other reasons. So uh, I, I needed to get a job while I was out there. And so I was a bouncer at a bar while I was in Oregon. And I was like, this this sucks. You know, I, I don't like doing this. I got a call from my boss in the fishing school. And he was like, hey, we want you to come back for the summer and don't go anywhere next winter. We're going to have something set up for you. So then I started kind of full-time year-round working for Orvis. I was working in, um, we have a shooting facility called Sandinona yep. in Millbrook, New York. And so I worked as a trapper, learning how to be a shooting instructor and uh, doing that kind of thing. And then back up to Vermont in the summertime. I mean, I did that for a couple of years. And then I started going down to the Florida Keys in the wintertime. So uh, I lived down in Key Largo. Yeah, I was working at Ocean Reef. We missed each other by a couple of years. <sighs> that place is a trip. That place is a trip. It's a different world. Just the, the golf carts alone is another world. So funny funny story about the golf carts. A good friend of mine, uh, while I was down there, he, he worked for Orbis for a long time, and another friend of ours uh, found a golf cart that was just abandoned in the mangrove somewhere. <laughs> and so we took the golf cart, and we got a new battery for it, covered it with stickers, put rod racks on it, and when we would go, there was, there was a staff bar, and th this was a while ago, and I'm sure they would fire us all in a heartbeat if they knew about this, but none of us worked there anymore, so I guess it's okay. We would run around in the middle of the night, 
probably after a couple drinks on, in this golf cart, and there would be all these ponds around Ocean Reef Club with, with lights, and there would be baby tarpon and snook running around. So we'd, like, sneak through the mangroves and then try to catch a tarpon, and then security would come out and yell at us. So we'd run into the golf cart, take off, try, and drive to the next one. Well, the problem was the golf cart was a piece of junk. And so we would die halfway during our getaway. And so I'd have to jump out of the golf cart because I weighed too much, run alongside the golf cart, sometimes pushing it till we got to a little hill, which there's not really much yeah, for it's hills. A reef. And uh, down there. And then we would kind of like coast, like there was like a little bridge we'd go over and down on the backside. That's where we'd make our getaway. Did that for a couple of years. And then they, uh, a position came available in, the, in our headquarters. Um, for the endorsed operations uh, manager uh, position. So basically all the Orbis endorsed guides, guide services outfitters um, for the eastern half of the U.S., um, I started working with that a lot. And, and, uh, and my other responsibility was we started developing these things called specialty schools where it's technique-specific or species-specific schools. Like this one right here at Tailwater Lodge is a steelhead school. So we kind of go over the three different techniques that are used pretty popular or that are very popular up here, which is indicator fishing, swinging flies, and then a technique called bottom bouncing, which it's kind of funny that some people poo-poo bottom bouncing. It's the exact same thing as tight line nymphing, in my opinion. I mean, think about it. When you're tight line nymphing, you're using a heavy fly to cast, mm -hmm. all right? You have a light, light leader. You want that fly to tick along the bottom, and you're going to try and feel the bottom with that fly and try and get it down in there, and you're in direct contact. When you're bottom bouncing, you have a long leader, some weight. You're only allowed one hook. Uh, up here, so you're feeling that way, tick the bottom. It's the same thing. And and I kind of find it funny because when I first started sealhead fishing up here, that was the technique of choice. And that's what we always did because I'm a casting dork and, and I really had a lot of fun with that. I had a friend who kind of showed me how to spay cast a little bit or cast a two handed rod. And so I started playing around with it. And it was more actually a rod to use for striper fishing, but I started using it up here, caught fish, and just fell in love with it and, and just kind of went full on head first into the, the two handed world. And so now I dork out with all the different types of lines and heads and tips and poly leaders and try to tie all these fancy, pretty spade type flies with jungle cock eyes and all that stuff. So I dork out on it a lot, but, uh, but you know, up here, with the swinging flies, I kind of find it funny. I tie all this, like, I don't want to say ornate because I'm not a good fly tire, um, but I try to tie these, like, fancy flies when 90% of the steelhead I think I've caught have been on a fly where it's just marabou on a hook. When I was up here a couple weeks ago for salmon, the guy who outfished everyone one morning, it was a three-quarter inch chunk of chartreuse egg yarn just tied to a hook. There was nothing else about it. The simplest, I mean, it wasn't even a fly. It's, it's incredible. It's incredible. We get so enamored with these flies and how, how intricate they can be and how realistic they look when something as simple as that works. Yep. I mean, the, the fish don't have that big of a brain. So when you mentioned Santa Nona, I remembered that I met you there in 2011. Mm -hmm. There was a big puddle far off in the field. We were playing with new rods. And you were using a puddle as your anchor yep. to roll cast. And I was sitting there like, that's one of the most intelligent things I've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, you, for a roll cast, you need a little bit of water tension. Or, or, or the line sticking to the water is going to help get you that roll cast and make it a lot easier. You can do a roll cast on grass. It's just a little bit tougher. You have to kind of make a longer casting stroke, if you will, like your hand is going to move a little bit more forward. You know, uh, Simon Gosworth is an unbelievable casting instructor, and he used to say, you know, to make a spade cast, your hand has to move from A to B in a straight line, and then C is kind of like a flick, so you go A, B, C. Well, when you do a roll cast on the grass, just think that distance from A to B is a little bit longer. So you just got to travel longer and then you can make that flick and you can get it to roll out on the grass. But if you have water, it's, it's, right. a, it's a pretty easy flick to get it out there. So what point between Vermont, Oregon, Florida, Vermont, did somebody say this guy's kind of talented with his casting, but not just in the casting, but the explanation of how to do it? Well, <laughs> 
I always really, really enjoyed the casting stuff, and I really like to kind of look at it. And I was working in the fishing schools, and I was lucky enough to meet some unbelievable fly fishing instructors all over the all over the country, um, going around doing trade shows and, and things like that. Um, we used to do the, do the uh, ISE trade shows, and then we would do the Somerset trade show, which is now the Edison Edison uh, New Jersey trade show. We would do, you know, ones out in Denver and in Oregon, and so we had these. Um, when we were doing this ISE trade show, they had a contest um, called the Best of the West, this casting contest. And I was like, all right, well, I want to give it a shot. And I actually, I did pretty good. And so they have like kind of regional ones and then they have a final. And I won uh, the the regional one in Denver against uh, some some folks that I always looked up to, you know, as casting instructors. So I was like, wow, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I was like, this is this is kind of cool. Now I look back and think of think of some of these casting contests. Yeah, they're I'd be it, it, so embarrassed to do one of those in front of people. It, that's got to be like I've never picked up a rod and tried to cast at a show because I know there's thirty eyes on you. It, it, there, there, there usually is a lot of eyes. It's a lot of pressure, and I started thinking about it and I, I, I got out of it. I, I got out of the the casting at targets thing and the the competition stuff because I, I started thinking about it. Like I don't. I don't cast a fly rod to try and hit a target necessarily like that's the only reason. I usually cast out a target because in hopes of trying to catch a fish. And so I kind of focused more in, in this is when the specialty school thing started to happen. It was more like I want to learn these different techniques to kind of focus on, you know, I really like to catch steelhead. I really like to catch striped bass. When I was down in Florida, I really like to catch, you know, go after bonefish. I never really caught a lot of them. You know, or, or go after permit, or go after tarpon, or snook, or, or something like that. When it was in Oregon, it was you know it was steelhead focused, and so all the casting was like, I want to make sure that I can put a fly where I need it to be, and not have that be something that holds me back from potentially catching a fish. If that makes sense, like I never wanted to have my casting be the reason I I can't get to where that fish is. And so it was something I always kind of worked on a lot, and uh, and I worked in the schools a lot, and, and I always had a background in teaching. I taught snowboarding for a long time. I did a stint teaching mountain biking for a very, very short amount of time, and I was a horrible mountain biker. I don't know how they let me do that. Taught shooting for a long time, and uh, Phil Monahan actually came up to me one day, and he said, hey, I have this idea. And so all the casting video stuff is all because of Phil Monahan. He came up to me and said, Hey, I want to do this. I want you to uh, do this casting video. You think you can do it? I was like, sure, I'll give it a shot. You know, so I gave it a shot, and I did uh, a couple casting videos. And I don't know how. So you know the scene in that movie, Old School, where Will Ferrell is having a debate against uh, Jimmy. Is it Jimmy Carver? I think or. Uh, they call him, he called him the Raging Cajun. Uh, oh yeah, uh, uh, James Carver. Or something. James Carville. We used to give yeah, my Car- wife and I used to go see him talk. That dude is so gross. He would pick his nose during commercial breaks and hawk loogies, and just do the most disgusting things during the commercial breaks. It was called Crossfire. Yes, with, yes. With our our, uh, our friend Tucker, and that show was ruined by Jon Stewart. Jon Stewart killed the show. If anybody doesn't know the story, I know Thomas loves the story, but. If you look up Crossfire with Jon Stewart, he basically killed that whole CNN show. Really? Yeah. Well, well. Anyways, in the, the there was a scene in the movie Old School where Will Ferrell has a debate, and he just like all of a sudden He's goes like, oh, blank, right? And then throws out this brilliant debate, and James Carville is like, like totally dumbfounded. I do the casting video, and I swear the same thing happened. I just went blank, and next thing you know, they're like, "Okay, you nailed it." I'm like, wait, what? They started, they hit the record button, and I did it in one shot. And Phil was like, that was great. You did it in one take. I was like, really? Uh, okay. And so so he put it online, and it, and people liked it. People responded to it. So we wanted to do more and more and more. And then uh, he did, uh, we did one with um, on the basic cast, and it got, I don't know, It's uh, a whole lot of people watched it. A lot of people watched it. And so... So Phil was like, "Okay, we got to do more and more and more of these," and and I was always like, "Yeah, sure, let's let's do them." I hate watching them. I I won't. I refuse to because I hate seeing myself on on screen. But 
Phil said people like it, and and I was like, okay, let's let's do it. And it, it was kind of fun doing it. And then um, Tom Rosenbauer was nice enough to ask me to help him out with the new Fly Fisher TV show. Uh, well, well, it wasn't. It was with the new Fly Fisher, but it was the Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing. So if you go to howtoflyfish.com. It's what's called the Orvis Learning Center. So there's animated knots, there's videos on how to catch smallmouth, pike, uh, musky, steelhead, saltwater fish. You know, where Tom's kind of going all over the place to these cool locations, catching these fish. And uh, he asked me to do the casting segments. So I did the casting segments for, for the TV show. And we just actually finished up season two, which is pretty exciting. And so I got to come back and do the casting segments again. But it was all, it's all because of Phil. Phil nice. asking to do it. So Phil's got to be an interesting guy. Phil, Phil's time. great. Phil, <laughs> Phil is, uh, he's an amazing, amazing encyclopedia of knowledge on not just fishing, but on a lot of things. Football. And, he's a yeah. big Tottenham fan. Yes, yes, he, he is. And I, I don't know the first thing about it, um, but he is, um, he, he's, a, he's a cool guy. Big he's Champions a, League fan, too. Yeah, he, he's, he's, a, he's a fun, uh, is, wait a minute. Champions League, isn't that like the video game stuff? No, that's all the top European clubs that play in a tournament from fall to spring. Oh. So you know the best team in England versus <laughs> Turkey versus Russia versus it Shows Spain. how much I know. Right. <laughs> Why yeah, is he holds. holding dynamite in the picture? I always thought that was a sandwich until I zoomed in. So so that, he um, he was doing something. I, I, I can't remember the exact story, but I... I I want to say it goes along the lines of they were trying to get some content for Orvis News and and they were going to do something on fishing a particular technique and he hooked some huge fish and fought it for a while and then the fish came off and so the original photo was him holding the fish that he lost and he's pretending like it was that big and so then every so often they'll they'll photoshop dynamite in there i think they photoshopped an alligator in it one time so maybe i did see a sandwich in his hand then probably yeah i just always pictured as a sandwich Pro probably i mean like a big big hoagie or something like that y'all need to do i think rosenbauer made a comment once about being on a stand-up paddleboard with tenkara rod you guys need to make a t-shirt with him <laughs> on, a, like on a paddleboard. On a pen, paddleboard. With growing up in Vermont, did you ever bump into him on the back no, hill? No. So it was years before I fished with Tom for the first time. You could fit in your pocket. <laughs> you could take him fishing, like, <laughs> put him right there. So it was. <laughs> I love you, Tom. Uh, yes, yes. I, I'm, I'm quite a bit taller than Tom. We were going to do. Um, we were going to take a picture because we were uh, for something. I, I think maybe it was the new fly fisher, and it was going to be Tom from his eye or from his nose up, and it was going to be me from my chin like down, twin. kind of like a, like a twins kind of photo or right. something like that. My roommate uh, in college used to stand on phone books or the first stair when we took pictures of him with his girlfriend. <laughs> maybe two phone books. Really? Yeah. Jeez. You know, it's it's it's. It, it, it's not easy being tall either, folks. All right. It's so, not, what are issues being tall? Uh, I hit airplane? my head. Airplanes. Airplanes suck. I travel a lot. I'm on a plane almost every other week these days uh, with the endorsement stuff and the school side of things. I mean, I was in Florida last week. I was in Minnesota the week before. I was, you know, or, or Wisconsin actually the week before that. Belize the week before that. So, um, I travel around a lot. Planes are the worst. There's always somebody sitting in front of me who wants to lean their seat back. And and I'm sorry if you're the person sitting in front of me. My, my knees can't go back any further. It's, uh, you know, I'm scrunched as much as I can be. So planes suck. Uh, I've split my head open on a doorway. Ooh. I actually hit my head on a doorway. Um, I it, once broke an exit sign at a bar in college. Going down the stairs. It was hanging, and I, I'm not that tall, but... It, the incline, it was it was yeah, low enough. It, so there's a pizza <laughs> restaurant downstairs that was money laundering for the mafia, oh, and upstairs was a college bar. And because Bowman's liquor was distilled two miles away, that's all they had. And it was we would drink double gin and tonics for three fifty. And on Tuesdays they had free Ooh, pizza from downstairs. I love me a good gin and tonic. Yes, yeah, so we would hang out with the homeless guys in town coming up for free pizza, and we would get our drink on and watch Jeopardy. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I think it's, uh, oh, I get asked every single day, how tall are you? How's the air up there? Did you play basketball? 
there's there's a couple others I'm sure every single day. You don't have a T-shirt with an FAQ on the back. I, I the kinda, guy has a card. Yes, yes. I was going to. I was going to. I, I saw the card. He's so like, yes, I'm six eight. The air is fine up here. And uh, no, I did not play basketball. <laughs> I, I did get mistaken for uh, I forget what his name was. Hey, but do you what, have a celebrity doppelganger? I forgot to ask that. Uh, so. I did have somebody come up and ask me for my autograph one time when I was in Oregon. Uh, somebody swore I was, uh, I can't remember his name. I'm not a basketball fan because I'm horrible at it. Uh, I was a player for the Portland Trailblazers. Swore. And I was like, no, no, I'm not. He's like, yes, you are. I know you are. You're, and like cornered me in the grocery like store. Like, I mean, cornered me. I'm like, I'm not, no, I'm not that guy. I don't know who you're talking about. And no, I'm not a uh, not a. The good tall boy looks normal size in your hand. Yeah, my neighbor when he drinks the cans of Stella it looks like that picture of Andre the Giant holding a Molson. Oh jeez, well didn't he drink like 132 yeah. some odd beers in one like sitting? Four cases of wine at a time. That guy was. That's that's on another level. Yeah, that's he was an anomaly. Yeah, yeah. It's Andre to the Giant. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Anybody want a peanut? <laughs> so I've got some, some casting questions. Sure. A lot of my clients are using themselves to throw the line in the fly instead of the rod. How could listeners and just fly fishers in general use the rod as it's designed to be an efficient tool to cast for them? So that's a that's a that's a good question. I try to tell them that you bend your arm, the transfer of energy goes from the base of the rod up. It's kind of like yep. when you flick, you know, mashed potatoes on a spoon or yep. something. Yep. But I still see them. I can hear them. They'll complain that their hand hurts. Most people they grip a rod too tight and they work too hard. And and it's 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 more common in guys. We're just ingrained. As soon as we get a tool in our hand, we want to help it. And we want to work as hard as we can to make it work. And and the fly rods are so sophisticated these days. And the fly lines, the shapes, the tapers, you know, what they're made out of. It's all super sophisticated. But at the same time, it's still just a stick and a string. You know, that's it. It's a very, very simple two-part tool. And the line is going to kind of get that fly out there. And I think... Uh, my wife actually came up with this. I think, Jackie? Yeah, my wife Jackie, she came up with this. She's a great fly casting instructor. She came up with this. And so so when you make a back cast, you want to move the rod and stop it. When you make a forward cast, you're going to move the rod and stop it. And that stop is the key. And there's a distance between where you stop it on the back cast and where you stop it on the forward cast. And if you were to kind of look at it from the side at somebody casting, it kind of makes like a wedge, like and so everybody uses the analogy. It's like 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock. I hate using that capital because... Capital Y. Yeah, or capital Y or something like that. Well, she likes to use the reference, like, think of it like a slice of pie. A lot of people say that. But then she says, go light on dessert. Small piece of pie. You don't have to move the rod all that much. It's just a little flick back, a little pause, a little flick forward. Let that line go straight behind you. Once it's straight, then you got to flick it forward. You know, you don't want to wait too long because it'll hit the water. If you don't wait long enough, though, you're going to pop your fly off. You'll hear that snap or that crack. But it's just a, a flick behind you, get that line to go straight. Pause, flick it in front of you. What happens when you pause? So when you pause, that line is rolling out. You're getting the loop. So everybody wants to talk, oh, I want to see a nice tight loop, a nice tight loop. Well, you get this loop that forms when you make that flick to a stop. And so that loop is rolling out behind you, and as it rolls out behind you, it's pulling that fly back. And then once that line straightens out, and your leader straightens out, and your fly is straight behind you, that's your cue. Now it's time to go forward. So I, I'm a big advocate of when you're learning to cast or practicing your casting, watch and see what's going on. Because you got to know that timing, how long it takes for that line to go straight behind you, it's going to change. If it's 10 feet of line, maybe it's a second. If it's 20 feet of line, maybe it's a second and a half. 30 feet of line, maybe two seconds. Like it changes when you're casting. So if you're practicing, watch what's going on. That line should go totally straight behind you in the tightest loop possible. The tighter the loop, the faster it goes behind you. So it kind of speeds it up a little bit. What if bit. they're hitting the water with their fly on the back cast? If they're hitting the water with the fly, they're doing one of two things. They're waiting too long or they're going way too far back. 
we don't have to bring that rod that far back. I, uh, I would tell people all the time during casting lessons, imagine you're leaning up against your brick wall. The rod can't go through the brick wall. It's going to stop up against it. So, yeah, that's straight up in the air. Maybe that's not the best place technically to stop the fly rod, but because we have this natural... Uh, 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 this natural ability or, or feeling that we have to help it, we naturally go a little bit further. We, we go through the wall when we do that. We, we break through walls when we're making that back cast. But imagine you're leaning up against one, hit that brick wall. Then on the forward cast, I like to look at the rod tip, and I want to stop that rod tip around eye level. You know, that's going to send it out. And, and you have to be kind of careful, though. You don't want to stop it at eye level straight down uh, with what you're looking at. You don't want to move the rod into your kind of sight plane. It's kind of like hand-in-eye -hand coordination. Like when you're throwing a ball, you don't look at your hand and make sure that it's lined up. Like you just naturally throw it and you have hand-in-eye -hand coordination. you got to do the same thing with that rod tip. You're just going to flick it forward and see where that fly lands. And eventually, you're going to be able to just look at it. And you don't have to look at the rod to see where it's going to go. You don't have to use anything to aim. It's just hand-in-eye -hand coordination. And start with a short cast. You know, most fish are caught within 40 feet. And that goes for any, any fish. Freshwater, saltwater, you know, warm water, cold water, it doesn't matter. Most fish are caught within that distance. That includes if you're on a bridge in the vertical space down. Correct. Correct. Well, sometimes that might be like 80 feet. You know? The tide was out. Tide was out. Okay, maybe 90 feet. <laughs> but I think a lot of people just work too hard and they move the rod too much. And they also have a tendency not to pause. When, when they're newer to casting and they're, they're trying it for the first time, let the line go straight. When you're practicing, cut your fly off. Try to get that line to land behind you totally straight then flick it forward totally straight and forget about that timing or that pause. But once you see it going straight, then try not to get it touch the grass, but still straighten out and then flick it forward. So you can kind of build this natural progression with that cast and then eventually you can incorporate your other hand, you can start shooting the line a little bit further, you can start kind of manipulating that cast by like changing your angle from a low angle cast to a high angle cast. And you know, I'm a big fan of, uh, of your back cast is a fishing cast, just like your forward cast. And so I'm a big fan of making a backhand cast in a lot of situations. And so, you know, it's just like a, I've almost been beating this to death, this, this analogy, but casting a fly rod has a lot of similarities with like playing tennis. You know, you got to have a good forehand and a good backhand because the only job in tennis is to hit that ball back across that net and make sure it lands where it's supposed to. Same thing with fly fishing. The only job is to really cast that fly out to that fish, get it somewhere. Well, we gotta send it behind us first. Well, sometimes you might be in a weird situation where it's easier just to make a backhand cast. You know, so your forward cast is going away from the fish, backhand to the fish. You know, and like I said though, most fish are caught within that 40 feet, and, and if you can practice that and get comfortable with that the next 50 60 70 feet that's going to come a little bit easier you know but you know in most fishing situations i think that's a great length to kind of work up to but work on that short game as well i was i was actually recently talking with um one of the best uh like permit anglers i think going right now um he's this guy down in the keys nathaniel um who's got a shop and and the guys won a bunch of permit tournaments and, and uh and he's an unbelievable angler and and he made it a good point you know a lot of people focus too much on teaching how to cast 30 feet of line well you got to start somewhere you got to start with five feet of line then 10 feet of line, then 15 feet of line, 20 feet of line, 30 feet of line. So you got to build up to that. you got to be able to sh start with 5 feet and then get to 30. Kind of In a saltwater situation, it's really important to be able to start short and get long very, very quickly. Speed, speed and accuracy is paramount in saltwater fishing. And it's, it's not being able to you know, cast your fly out 90 feet. Yeah, that might help if you're prospecting a lot, but in, in a sight fishing game, you got to be able to put that fly at 20, 30, 40, 50 feet in one or two casts. I don't want to catch a fish at 90 feet. No, no, you can't. You can't. There's so much you stretch in the fly a line. fish here with 40 feet out. It's just, like today, they were going for the bridge. When you think going to the bridge, there's three people between me and the bridge. I'm yeah. done. Yeah, that's... Uh, 
you know, plus it's cold out. You're getting ice in your guides. If that line's going in and out, uh, if, you, if you have a shorter length of line, not as much as traveling in and out of your guides, you don't have to deal with the ice up here. But, but I, think, uh, I think too much emphasis is put on casting as far as you can and see how far it goes. I think, you know, good technique at 30 or 40 feet, you know, but being able to go from 5 feet up to 30 or 40 feet, that's going to make you a good fly. Should people put a little Sharpie mark on their fly line? So you can. You can take a black Sharpie, put a little bar on it to mark off different distances when you're practicing. A lot of fly lines these days, a lot of the nice uh, high-end fly lines have color changes built into the lines. And, and so that color change is great for, uh, for you to kind of get a good reference point. Okay, what does 30 feet of fly line look like? 30 feet at your hand versus 30 feet of fly line at the tip. Well, 30 feet of fly line at your hand is actually 39 feet with a 9-foot leader. It's a 10-foot leader. It's 40 feet. You know, and if you have 30 feet of fly line at the tip of the rod, you have another 9 feet of line in your rod and then a 9-foot leader. So you're at 48 feet. So I sent Dan an email, which probably didn't get to him if my emails weren't getting to you. Could it be possible to make a textured line so you would know when, say, your shooting head is right at the tip of your rod and you've got running line in your fingers so you wouldn't have to visualize it? So there is a uh, – a, so scientific anglers made a line, and they, they make it right now. It's actually a new line called their Scandi Light. And they also have their Skagit light line, and they have heads, which is you know a fat chunk of chunk of line with a loop in the end of it. You attach it to a running line, then you have that junction where you know where that a is. Like, hinge. Yeah, you, you you hear it kind of tick the rod. But they made an integrated line, and I thought this was a brilliant idea. Where the running line ends and meets the head, the fat section, and it's integrated so it's smooth. They made it black and a couple feet long. And they actually textured it. Oh, see, I'm pretty heavy behind the scenes here. It, it, I'm behind so, the times. So it was, it was heavily textured. So I, I took the line, I got, gave it a shot. I wanted to play around with it. I, I love to have a two-handed rod. It's a 12-foot long six weight, and uh, I use it a lot. And I use it a lot in Oregon on a river called the North Umpqua, and it's it's a, it's probably one, it, it's one of my favorite rivers. It's beautiful. And uh, there's summer steelhead in there. And I got one of these lines to try out, and it worked great on the rod. But what was wild about it was when it was low light early in the morning or just before dark when the fishing was really good. And this is summer steelhead, so they kind of act like salmon a little bit. They'll come up and eat a dry fly, but usually in those low light times. Well, you couldn't really see the color change, even though it was like a light gray to black. But I would strip in, and then all of a sudden hear a little... Like you feel like uh, like you just ran across like hitting rumble strips. Yeah, you would feel it. Called the like, rumble oh, strip line. There it is, and then you'd go make your cast. And so it was a short section, you know, two three feet long, but you would feel it going through the guides, and you'd be like, okay, there it is. And then you knew it was time to go again. Like you could close your eyes and cast it, and, and you'd be at that right spot. Right. I mean, I used to um, a long time ago. Uh, I used to Someone, do. Who uh, got coming in? That's that's my brother-in-law actually right there. Jackie's brother? Uh, no, no, no. My uh, younger sister's younger husband. sister. Okay. Yeah. Come on in. You be on the podcast too. You look like a Sherpa. We're doing a podcast right now. Oh, you are. Yeah. You want to be on it? You want to be on it? No. I'm gonna go put my shit in my room. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a six hour drive. So. So my brother-in-law right here, everybody should, if they ever see him or hear of him, his name's Anthony. He just caught his first bluefin tuna this year, and it was right amazing. On. Where's your six-hour drive to? Boston. Boston. You don't have the accent. What's the best <laughs> sandwich in Boston? Tough question. <laughs> you got to know that. Uh, Baco, North End. Okay. While we're on the sandwich subject, where's the best sandwich in Burlington? Burlington? Oh, so in Burlington, uh, late night kind of intoxicated sandwich? Yes. Country Cart Deli, KKD. All right. What KKD about? In, would be in Burlington. They would have a breakfast sandwich we would get at 3 o'clock in the morning after coming back from the bar called the Rise and Shiner. I don't know if they're still around, but it, ha it was a hoagie roll or a sub roll. Uh, 
my father's from Philly, so we'd always call them hoagie rolls. But it'd be a hoagie roll with two hash browns, oh sausage, goodness. eggs, and cheese. And but it would be like a like a twelve inch sub roll. Breakfast they used to sandwich. sell that here. It was amazing. <laughs> Who's got the best sandwich in Manchester? In Manchester, I got to give it up to my man Neil at Hound Dogs. His his cheesesteak is oh. out of this world good. It's it's pretty good. And then it's pretty darn good. I, the only thing I could tell you about the Key Largo scene for sandwiches is the day old blueberry muffins next to Ocean Reef Club's uh, fly shop. Because that's all I ate down there with day old blueberry muffins. Because I think they were like a favorite thing was the Publix fried chicken the next day cold fried chicken on a boat or uh there was a there was a restaurant we used to go to that had the best so fish tacos car. i didn't have no a car. no no i had a bike oh i had a oh bike. my goodness so I, I would ride up and down down that sketchy road where yeah. people are going 100 the miles closest an hour thing is subway yeah we would go down so we actually we lived in key largo and i would ride up with my boss to uh to go there i did have a car down was there but Duber I heard, then, there then uh so duber was there the second year i was there okay so the first year I was there, um, Duber wasn't. But then um, when we were in town, there was this place that had the best seafood. And it was one of those joints where it was like a uh, styrofoam plate, plastic forks kind of thing. Like you didn't go there for the ambiance. You went there for the food. It was called Calypso's. And it was the best seared tuna taco I've ever had. So and, I don't eat fish. Oh, man. It was good. It was good. By choice or... I just think it's, yeah, I, I grew up semi-kosher with odd eating habits in our house. There was no fish, no shellfish. Really? In fact, the first time I ever saw my dad use a red onion was last Saturday. You're kidding. Yes. I, the first time I ever had a red onion was in college. But I grew up eating Indian food and just exotic things. Like tandoori chicken, lentils, basmati rice was a Tuesday night dinner for us. Really? There was no meatloaf and mashed potatoes. It was wow. It was very exotic. Friday night pizza night. I mean, no, you Friday didn't... was like porcini mushroom risotto. What? Wow, a lot of porcini wow. mushrooms growing up. Wow. Funny thing about mushrooms. My father. Uh, interesting fun fact. My father used to run a, a warehouse that grew shiitake mushrooms. And it was the first place to ever be able to commercially grow shiitake mushrooms. They hired a bunch of scientists, uh, uh, mycologists, yeah. I guess, from Penn State. They came in. They found out a way to make. They had this on the, machine. On the, old, on the old stumps? With yeah. The well, they, they, they would make these logs. And it was the weirdest looking machine. It looked like it was just taking a. A lathe? Uh, no, no. It would crap out these these logs of stuff like sawdust with a mycelium and and all sorts of you know things to make these mushrooms grow and then they would put it into this you know cooled you know kind of room and then it would start growing mushrooms shiitake mushrooms and they were the first place to be able to uh, commercially do it and then people caught on on how to do it and then then they were all over the place i remember i must have been but i hated mushrooms as a uh, kid because we had so many of them yeah in sixth grade, we would go trout fishing for brook trout in the Shenandoah. And on the way back, we would hit up some guy who grew shiitakes on logs under his deck. Wow. We used to drive 40 minutes to three hours for basmati rice or some weird potato that was grown in sand on the Outer Banks. Cool. Just Yeah, my childhood eating was not normal. Well, my wife and I... We love trying new things, and uh, and it's and it's so funny. My wife would tell you she she grew up on like Wonder Bread, chicken nuggets, and and you know very very plain 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 food. But now uh, she had like I, I love I love shrimp like good wild shrimp, and uh, you know I ma I'll make shrimp cocktail or something. I like to make a like a real simple cocktail sauce with just uh, good horseradish, ketchup, lime juice, you know that kind of thing. And uh, she's like, no, I don't like horseradish or, or ketchup. I, I won't like cocktail sauce. She tries Sweet. it for the first time. This is just a couple of years ago. Does she ago. not like ketchup? She does not like ketchup. Abby Schuster despises ketchup also. Really? Yes. She tried it. Boom. Loves it. Loves Puts it. it on everything now. Well, she doesn't put it on anything, but when I make her a cocktail and, and there's there's some cocktail sauce, it's gone pretty quickly. Like I, that's awesome. Normally, I would be like, oh, I, you know, I'd be that obnoxious guy eating all the shrimp. Is your daughter an exotic eater? Because when they're little, they'll eat anything, and then she, they get older. Our our, our daughter, uh, she will eat just about anything. My daughter eats lettuce and mayo, 
Iceberg lettuce and mayo on an everything bagel every day for lunch. Really? It's so weird. Our, uh, so our, our daughter, how, how old's your daughter? Eight. Eight. Ours is, uh, she just turned a year old in October. She, the only thing she isn't crazy about, but she'll still eat, is avocado. Which is kind of bizarre. A lot of kids like avocado. I wish we could have avocado and lemon trees. If I ever move to California, that's all I'm having is avocados <laughs> and lemon trees. Absolutely. I I love peaches, so I want a peach tree, oh, too. Yeah. We had a... Uh, it, it was funny. So she, our daughter is our first kid. We would read all the... Just over okay. a year old. And so we're still like reading all these books. Be like, oh, this is how you're supposed to introduce food. Well, my wife, she works very, very hard. And I'm traveling a lot. So, so our daughter got into daycare pretty early. And you said that's halfway to work. Uh, yeah, it's halfway to work. Four miles to work? F- about four miles oh to work. Oh, my gosh. It's pretty awesome. That's like it's the closest pretty, gas station to me is four miles. The gas station is further away. Okay. Like, we got to drive an extra two miles to the gas Ooh. station. So we were kind of slowly introducing all this food because we we're like, okay, we got to make sure, you know, she's got to try this for a couple weeks or, or for like two or three days or whatever it is to see if she's allergic to it. And then we can introduce the next food and then the next food and the next food. I mean, total neurotic first time parents. I mean, just completely ridiculous. So our daughter's at daycare. And then all of a sudden we see she's starting to eat the lunch that they serve at, at daycare. And and the daycare that she's at is, is fantastic. And they do a wonderful job. Next thing you know, like, yeah, she had a chicken quesadilla for lunch and, uh, you know, she had some orange slices and egg and, and this and we're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like we, we sort of freaking out. Yet. We haven't introduced that that's yet. Not, that's still on the schedule. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We haven't even gotten there yet. So then we're just like, ah, screw it. Threw it out the window and, and let her eat whatever, whatever she wants, you know? And, uh, you know, so we just let her try stuff and she eats it and she loves it. My daughter's new thing is you've never heard of mumbo sauce. No. Mumbo sauce is a DC thing. It's sweet and sour sauce mixed with hot sauce. Ooh. She puts mumbo sauce in everything. And then her new thing is kombucha. Oh, I can't do kombucha. I can't do that either. Oh, I had kombucha. Uh, so my first experience with kombucha, my mother um, with the dairy business, my mother, she's, she's really into natural food and, and things like that. And a lot of uh, the accounts where her yogurt – is, uh, is sold to a lot of these health food stores to have kombucha. It's it's pr- a staple to any kind of health food store. So she gets this thing of kombucha, and I had never seen it before, heard about it before. And I come home. I was probably like 17, 18, 19 years old, something like that. And I come to the house, and I'm like, or my parents' house, and I was just like, man, I really want something to drink. And I see this red oh, drink, no. and I'm like, Sunny D, all right, kind of thing. Like, uh, you know, I thought it was like Kool-Aid or something like that or, or some kind of fruit punch. So I grabbed the bottle, crack it open, take a huge slug. Well, there was a huge slug in it. That big SCOBY uh, just like went, just went, went down, down and I just threw up instantly right oh. there. And it just scarred me for life. And um, uh, I had a real nasty or nasty flu a couple of years ago, and a, a good friend of mine, he and his wife, they're such sweet people. They uh, they saw I was sick and they felt bad, so they wanted. They're like, you really need some probiotics, and so they made me a huge vat of kombucha, and it you had this, ball soup. It had this giant scoby in it, and I'm and I'm I felt so bad because it was such a nice, generous, gracious gift from them, and I couldn't touch it. I couldn't touch it, so my wife actually gave out the kombucha to some of her friends, and apparently that scoby is still alive to this day, nice. like five years later, six years later, floating around Brooklyn somewhere to like some of her uh, her, her friends in the in the art world. I guess uh, it's 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 pretty crazy, but apparently they're all like, "This is the best kombucha we've ever had." Is there any uh, other food you won't eat? Uh, I hate a slice of tomato on a sandwich. What if it's like? A good tomato, though. A slice tomato on a sandwich ruins it for me. Okay. Now. If it's super thick, I can't do it. It's got to be thin for me. See, that, that's that's the one that, that is, is the worst for me. But like a caprese or whatever it's called salad with like a like an heirloom tomato, the mozzarella, balsamic, basil, that kind of stuff. Love it. Good BLT in the summer? Can't do it. Wow. Can't do it. It makes the bread soggy. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's it's nasty. Dice them up, put them on a taco, love it. I never liked tomatoes on sandwiches until I went to Paris. Yeah? 
because I've always grown up with just nasty, mealy white tomatoes. Well, that's that's what I felt like was always on all the sandwiches, and so yeah. I couldn't do it. I d- and then growing our own tomatoes now, it's a huge difference. I, I We grow tons of tomatoes. We like growing the different kinds. We're like, ooh, we got these uh, German lunchbox tomatoes, and we have, I, I keep, for some reason, I keep on calling them German Johnsons. I don't know why. And my wife picks on me for that, but uh, like beef steaks, and then this kind of heirloom, and the, these green zebras, and it's it, it's fun to grow a bunch of stuff. I mean, we we, we really like to garden. Or uh, I know, eat grow maybe ten percent of, of what we grow. It's all for my wife. Jalapenos up the wazoo. Oh, we had tons this year, tons. I uh, I got into uh, smoking uh, smoking meats this summer. I'm I'm kind of late to the game on it. And uh, I started smoking jalapenos because we had so many of them. Oh, yeah. And I started throwing jalapenos in everything. I mean, well, I kind of ruined jalapenos for my wife. She's so like, I triggered jalapeno poppers, and they didn't come out visually how I was wanted them. So I put them in the crock. Well, the sorry, I put them in the food processor, and I made smoked jalapeno pepper dip. Ooh, that was awesome. That sounds amazing. Yeah, that sounds amazing. It was. Uh, I, I threw those smoked jalapenos. I threw them on the uh, the pork shoulder we had. I threw them in the corn muffins, and then she said, "Just don't put them in the coleslaw." What do I do? I put them in the coleslaw. Oh, my wife would. And she want my wife wanted to kill me after that. I'm I'm sorry, sweetie. <laughs> my wife puts hot sauce on her hot sauce. In fact, going home tomorrow, my GPS coordinates are not home. It's gonna be the Indonesian market in Gaithersburg to get the Indonesian hot sauce that I found there. Really. It's an Indonesian market next to a Brazilian market next to a Sri Lankan market. That sounds amazing. That's just what, like, what it is like where we live. That, uh, so when you come down, Peruvian chicken. That's what you have to have. Uh, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Ask Dan about Peruvian chicken. Yeah. And mumbo sauce. He'll know both of those. Okay. There's mumbo no sauce. one else that does Peruvian chicken except the D.C. metro area. Really? It's charcoal marinated citrus cumin chicken. You buy it by the half, whole, or quarter. And then you get two sides, and which is usually for us, beans and rice and fried yuca. And then you get a little Dixie cup of chopped jalapeno sauce and then yellow white sauce that they won't tell you what's in it. And you can't buy it anywhere. But they give you an ounce. And you're like, yo, I need a cup of this. Oh, man. Peruvian chicken is... I told my wife we need to retire to Colorado, open up a Bon Me Peruvian chicken restaurant. Oof. That sounds good. That sounds good. I've never tried it, but it, it sounds amazing. Have you ever had a bon mi? No. Oh, my God. What's it's the, the Vietnamese. So Vietnam used to be French territory. Mm-hmm. So you have the French influence of the baguette, and then you put roast pork, tofu. Oh, is that the little the, the little cr- bun? No, not a bao. But it's on a, a crusty, like, hoagie bun, French baguette bun. And I get the ga, which is chicken, no cilantro. You get pickled daikon radish, pickled carrots, fresh jalapeno slices, and this yellow mustard sauce. They used to be about $3 for a 7-inch sandwich, but then people cut off. Bon me, and they just wrap it in wax paper and just rubber band it. And, oh, my God. And and everybody thought we were going to talk about casting. We've yeah. been going off on food. I'll go back to casting. <laughs> yeah. So have you ever seen a picture of somebody in slow motion getting hit in the face with a water balloon? Yes. What would a fly rod do at that same speed? If a fly rod hit you in the face? No. If you, let's say you were, that's the exact question you should ask when I'm at this point. What if someone's casting, what would that fly rod look like if you slowed it down? Where would it start bending and where would it finish? So it's going to start bending um, in the tip section when you start to move the rod. Um, so as soon as you, now... I said earlier, when you're casting, you got to let that line go straight. And, and that's, that's incredibly important. And for a long time, I used to say, oh, yeah, you want to start your cast right before your line straightens out. Well, n- no, you want to start once that line is straight. The, the cheesy old expression I used to say is you can only pull rope, you can't push it. And so you can only pull a straight rope. Or Yesterday, a rope. you could have pushed wet rope here because <laughs> the anchor line was frozen straight. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but when if, if you want to pull a line, you have to pull it when it's straight. And then as soon as you start to move it, you start pulling something. 
So if you imagine you're pulling your fly through the air, well, you can't pull, start pulling that fly through the air until that line is straight. So you want to let it go straight so as soon as you start to move that rod forward, it's already under tension. It's already starting. And the weight of that line is going to start bending that rod uh, kind of in the tip section. And then as you move the rod forward, you need to kind of speed up a little bit. And that bend is going to come down in the rod a little bit further and a little bit further and a little bit further. With 20, 30 feet of line, it's supposed to bend at a certain point of a rod, and that usually kind of dictates, you know, the action of the rod. Is it a fast action? Is it a slow you used to action? Tip mid, full. Yeah. You know, full flex rod, more of that rod's going to bend with that 30 feet of line. And so, so you're casting that rod, and it's kind of bending as it comes down that rod when you're moving that rod forward. Well, when you have a short line, you have to make that rod bend because there isn't enough mass up there in the air with that line. Let's say it's 10 feet of line. You have to bend the rod, so you have to physically speed up a little bit more and maybe bend it a little bit more with kind of your flick at the end of that cast uh, when you're coming forward. So, so if you think about it, it starts to bend at the tip and it's going to work its way down towards the grip of the rod as you're accelerating or as you're speeding up. And then you're going to come to a stop and that rod's going to start unbending from the butt of the rod out towards the tip. It's going to straighten out. It might bounce a little bit, hopefully not too, too much. Um, you want to kind of try and dampen that a little bit with your hand just by relaxing your grip. And so if somebody has a too tight of a grip and their hand's tired, you relax it, you actually cast better. You cast better with a relaxed grip. That rod tip straightens out, that line's going to jump right out and get to that target. So it kind of starts at the tip, goes down to the butt, then it starts at the butt of the rod, goes out to the tip of the rod. Any good hacks for teaching roll casting? Yes. Bring your hand up to your ear. When you're holding your rod, uh, most people, when I see this all the time, when somebody's trying to make a roll cast, they keep their hand down low, below their chest, down by their stomach, and they, and they start flicking it really hard, and they also end with their rod at the end of their flick down low. If you take your hand and put it up by your ear, like you're on the telephone, but it's somebody really loud and obnoxious, so you're holding the phone away from your ear, that's your back cast, or that's your roll cast position. You're going to go from there, and then your hand's going to go straight forward, not down. So you're not trying to tack a nail into a table, you're trying to tack a nail into a wall, if you will. Some people like to use the hammer analogy. You're going to hit a wall. So you want that rod tip to stop high, eye level, a little bit above eye level. When you flick it forward, once that line straightens out, though, that's when you can then lower the rod down or keep it up if you have to kind of mend your line or do something after when you're fishing. So hand up by your ear, come straight forward, get a good flick to a stop right around eye level. What about teaching double hauling? So double hauling, double hauling I think is one of the most overdone or over talked about things in casting. Is it as simple as womp womp? Uh, it pretty much, it can be, it can be, but you have to build it up um, when you're learning. You have to start with a good cast and the double haul helps a good cast get better. It doesn't help a bad cast get good. You got to have a good cast first. You can cast a whole fly line without the double haul. It can be done. I've, I've done it. I've, I've, we did a little video for it on Tom's Instagram, Rosenbauer's Instagram. You can cast a whole fly line without a double haul. But what the double haul does is it makes that cast easier. My really corny analogy, and I'm sorry if you heard it, but a double haul is like a turbo in a car. You can drive a car without a turbo. You can't drive a turbo without a car. Okay, The cast is the car. You need a good cast. So you want to work on that cast one side at a time. Make a back cast, lay it on the grass. Make a forward cast, lay it on the grass. But do it at a low angle. Get comfortable with that, and the line should land totally straight, and you want to work with a consistent length of line. Hold the line in your other hand, then try to pull the line when you make a back cast. Let it land on the grass. Try it on the forward cast. Pull the line. Let it land on the forward cast, on the grass. Then try to pull the line and go back. That's the womp womp. You pull it, you go back. It's kind of like pull starting a lawnmower or a weed whacker, you got that pull cord, you pull it, it wants to go back. That's why I bought electric, I hated pulling that thing. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to do that, 
but you're going to work on it one side at a time, and you got to work on it with a consistent length of line. I, I see people wanting to learn how to double haul. They strip off all the line on their reel because they think, double haul, 100 feet of line. Let's do this. And that's not the way to learn. you got to work with 40 feet of line, you know, 35, 40 feet, something like that, in that length, and work consistently on that. Once you get comfortable working your back cast and your forward cast, then try not landing on the grass. Let it just touch the grass and then go. Then try not to touch the grass and go, but let it rest on the grass on one of the sides, like usually on the forward cast. Once you get comfortable with that, bring it up a little bit higher. Make a quartering cast, a kind of 45 degree angle. So start off real low, one side at a time, then just start bringing it up a little bit higher. Once you get it smooth and comfortable, then you can start adding a little bit more distance and going into shooting line. You should already know how to shoot line before you think about trying to work on that double haul. You should already be comfortable casting 25, 35, 45, 50 feet of line without that double haul before you start kind of thinking, okay, I really want to learn how to this, do this double haul because it makes a good cast better. That's, that's the key with the double haul. But I honestly think, you know, when I'm out fishing, like let's say I'm saltwater fishing and i got to make a long cast, and I start with five feet of line, I'm going to go five feet to maybe 10, 20 feet of line with a regular cast. I'm going to go 20 feet of line to maybe 30, 40 feet of line with a regular cast, double haul, shoot the rest. So it's like two, three false casts max. You know, and on that last one, I'm double hauling to then shoot it out to that longer distance. I'm not double hauling the entire time. I'm actually only double hauling once to get it out there. And I think that's, uh, I think people double haul to death. And, and it just causes a lot more problems. So I actually teach it a lot less now and focus on it a lot less because it's not going to help you catch more fish if you're focused on the double haul. You want to focus on the fish. Right. You want to get a good cast. That's what I'm here for. It's focusing <laughs> on the fish. Absolutely. All right. Let's ask some non-fishing questions. Okay. Where are you going for Thanksgiving dinner? Uh, my aunt and uncle's house in a little town called Poundall, Vermont. Are you bringing anything? Yes. We're not sure yet, though. They have like a, a Google, some kind of Google thing. Like uh, where where we're supposed to put down what we're going to make. So I've been talking with my wife back and forth, and uh, we're not sure what we're going to make yet. What's your favorite part of the Thanksgiving meal? Oh, the wine. Yes. The wine. We're hosting this year, so I don't have to drive. <laughs> and my neighbor's hosting his side, so we're going to be hanging out all day. Nice. We're tra I'm triggering two turkeys this year. Two? You need to get a Traeger. That's a life-changing decision. That's uh, there are few things I can say better than your life will change when you get a Traeger. Really, I've been cooking meat my wrong my entire life. Everyone has been. It is the wrong way to do it. Until you got one of those. The meatloaf on that versus meatloaf in the oven is really night and day. Huh? It's it's incredible. Where's the worst place you've ever fished? Worst place I ever fished. Oh man! Well, if <laughs> uh, the worst place I ever fished. Uh, oh, jeez. Now, bad all around, or bad because of the just like you didn't catch anything because it all just sucked. Um. Well, I, I did a trip down to, uh, to Baja to go try and catch some rooster fish, actually, with my brother-in-law, who, who caught the this, only rooster this fish. This brother-in-law right here. He caught the only rooster fish while we were down there. And, and here I am, Mr. Uh, you know, casting instructor and, and fishing guy, and, and, and I don't catch one. But, but This guy ran down the man. He ran down the man. He got the rooster fish, um, the only rooster fish that, that we caught. But I will say this, it was not the worst trip because it was an absolutely amazing experience. I mean, drinking Pacifico beer, riding in side-by-sides up and down the beach. I, I'm not condoning drinking and driving 
it's uh, Mexico. All, yeah, all terrain vehicles. Life is but, different in Mexico. But but it was a ton of fun, and like the the, the species, we got a, caught a ton of different species of fish. Everybody wants to go there for the rooster fish, but I think if you go there with an open mind and just say, you know what. I just want to experience it, try and catch some fish, any kind of fish. And we caught jacks. We caught these crazy trumpet fish. We caught... Um, I've ca- trumpet fish on the fly is weird. This thing was weird looking. It, it, it may not have been a trumpet fish, but it looked just like one. I think it was like a corn, cornet fish yeah, or something. Corn, yeah. And the, have you seen them in the water before? This thing was Have crazy. they just moved like... The way they look underwater is just bizarre itself. It was it was crazy, and then uh, we caught uh, 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 skipjacks. We we hooked into a marlin uh, for a, a hot second. I, I mean, so we didn't catch as many fish as, as maybe we would have liked. But it was a family vacation. It was supposed to be just fun. Fishing wasn't the focus. Although my brother-in-law, we were pretty darn focused when we were going. Um, but uh, it, it was it was an amazing trip, so I can't really say that that was the worst trip. We just didn't really catch catch the fish that the we the target were, species, the, yeah, the, the glory species, right. you know, the marquee fish. But if you go there with a the mindset of just going to have fun, it's an amazing, amazing place. I was doing a school one time, and uh, I was doing a school one time in the Bahamas, and we got evacuated because of a hurricane. So that, that kind of sucked, and so didn't really get to fish. Spent most of the time trying to uh, negotiate getting everybody off the island while they were out on the water. And the fishing was actually really good because the storm the was coming. coming in. But we, uh, we were the last plane out of the Bahamas before a hurricane hit, which, which I know is it, probably not a cool thing to talk about after the disaster that just happened with Dorian. You know, those poor people in, in Abaco and, and Grand Bahama, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. We were on Abaco, at Abaco Lodge, and uh, it was Hurricane Michael. And so it, it didn't do a lot of damage, but the lodge managers, they were new, and it was their first experience with a hurricane. And so they were working with the lodge and trying to get figure out what do they need to do. And they did an unbelievable job, but I had to figure out, okay, what to do with all the guests, you know. I, you know, clearly T minus, you know, one day or two days and, and this storm is going to be here. So it's like, OK, you know, you need to get on this flight because this is the last flight. Like all the little puddle jumper planes were gone. So there was like one Delta flight left. And it's like everybody, I don't care who you fly or, or how, how you got here. How small that plane for you? They were incredibly small. You should have just been inside the like cargo hold. Yeah, I, I should have just like laid down in the plane or something like that and, and gone. But uh, when we took off, the crazy thing is, I remember looking out the window and you could see the outer, like some of the outer rain bands of the Ooh. hurricane. It was just like black coming at us. It, it was it was it's pretty like in, pretty creepy. Uh, in Armageddon. Wait, was it Armageddon? Yeah, when they're flying out after the White House got blown up. Yeah. Like yeah, that. it was it was pretty creepy, and so so there was that that experience that was that was pretty rough. I mean, I I spent a lot of t- I spent a lot of times down in the, in the Florida Keys, and I love it down there. But I must be some kind of masochist because I do not catch a lot of fish down there. I try, and I, I have some moments of glory here and there. But I've, I've had a lot of goose eggs, a lot of goose eggs um, while I'm down there. And so that can be kind of tough sometimes. Um, I had a, I don't know, I'm, I mean, I, I take it all with a grain of salt. And, and you know, they're, they're, you're always going to have, you know, the weather's weather. So you can't really factor that into, you know, if the fishing is good or not good. Um, if, if that was the case, I'd say my, my home river is one of the toughest rivers around. I mean, there's, there's great fish in it, but sometimes they just disappear, and it's like, where did they go? And, uh, and like that Tuesday could, yeah. here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Tuesday here. Yeah, when it was bitter cold and uh, the fish just stopped eating. I mean, I've, I've had days up here on the Salmon River where, you know, yesterday, for example, did not touch a fish, bump a fish, anything. I mean, you you got. I admitted fish. to being an absolute wuss yesterday. That was that was too much for me. But you got a good fish. Yeah, and I should have gone right back to bed. Yeah, <laughs> I should have been back in bed at nine a.m. yesterday. Oh, I fished for two and a half hours, three hours. A friend of mine and his father came into town, and uh, so it, 
we uh, we were hanging out with each. Uh, the last time we saw each other, we were uh, I was down on school in Belize, and he was down there. And um, you know, so he said he was going to be in the area. I'm like, hey, you want to get on the water? I didn't. This was a couple weeks ago. I didn't realize it was going to be like 10 degrees or 20 degrees, whatever it was. And uh, and so he came up, and we got together and poked around for a little bit. Kind of got a late start. You know, we didn't start till probably noon. Fish for about two hours, maybe, and then we call, called it a day. It was it was pretty brutal. Yikes! All right, next question: What are you, your, and Jackie's most irrational fears? What is she most scared of that you can tell, but she'll be embarrassed? Uh, I don't know. My wife is is incredibly brave. She'll she'll try just about anything. Spiders, snakes. <laughs> She doesn't mind spiders. She, well, she doesn't like spiders. I mean, she's like I'm the one who has to go catch the spider with a paper towel and try to let it go outside without crushing it. In, uh, in, in Russian household, you do not kill spider. This is what I, I learned at home with Russian wife. You don't kill spider. You never kill a spider in the house. It's very I, bad. I, I try not to. I mean, I, I don't want to kill anything, uh, really. I mean. She doesn't like spiders all that much. Carnies, she, wasps, wasps, wasps. Yeah, she I she doesn't do wasps. she doesn't like wasps. Um, for some reason, we have a lot of like yellow jackets and wasps and hornets, and they just like our house for some reason. You know, the you outside, have an old house. Uh, no, actually, it's pretty new, but for some reason, our house just, is new. It's from nineteen twenty. No, no, no. Actually, okay. our house is it was built in 84. Uh, so it's, it's like brand ours. new. It's yeah. like brandy new, brand brand new. Ours uh, is from the what? 60s and Wi-Fi won't work. It's so the walls are so tightly built. It was built before houses were like just crap. It was so our house is like solid brick. Wow. You cannot get Wi-Fi outside. So that was uh, that was at a point. See, originally houses had like so many cracks and seams because they would flex and move and stuff like that. This was, you know, tight, right? Just it it is structurally sound. Right. What about you? What are you scared of? Heights. Heights. Yeah, yeah. Heights. And heights that's freak the me tall out. Joke. Yeah, and I, and I'm a, and I'm tall. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, you know, I was trying to clean my chimney. I got halfway up my roof and I turned around. I'm like, no, I can't do this. I can't do this. And uh, uh, I, I love to snowboard and I was, you know, going to ski resorts my whole life. I'm the guy who's holding the bar. Like, I'm the guy who puts the bar down quickly, holds on to it, and then holds the back of the seat. Ski and you look as an awkward. I don't ski, but I've been on a lift in the summer and it's, it's not pleasant. Uh, I, the gondola, I do like. I don't mind the gondola. I don't like when I look down. So I, uh, Our friends got married on the top of Keystone in Colorado, which was two or three different lit like ski lifts to get up there. It was a good thirty minutes. Oh wow! Worst hangover of my life. Yeah, yeah, the elevation that was really will, will really mess you up. Favorite Harrison Ford movie? Ooh, <sighs> Raiders of the Lost Ark. I mean, I'm gonna have to change that question. Everyone's got Raiders. Yeah, Raiders. Favorite Ooh. Eddie Murphy movie? Ooh, 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 uh, um, uh, coming to America. All right. I think that's what everyone's going to say. Not Daddy Daycare. We just watched that with my kid. Daddy Daycare. No, I, I mean, he was in Air Force One, right? Eddie Murphy? No, no, Air, Harrison, Harrison Ford. Ford. Oh, yes. Yeah, Harrison Ford. Air, Air Force One was good. I mean, obviously, you know, Empire, you know, uh, you know, A New Hope, and uh, Return of the Jedi, you know, amazing. Not Sabrina. Who? Sabrina. No, <laughs> no. I mean, he was amazing in that. Um, I, the Fugitive, he was amazing in that. Uh, um, oh, there's a bunch of others. I mean, uh, graffiti. Uh, yeah. Apocalypse Now. He was in Apocalypse Now. Yeah. Wow. I did, I did not know that. Harrison Ford's an amazing actor. I've got a Indiana Jones lunchbox at home. It's pretty awesome. What? A friend bought it for me. I don't think it was a wedding gift. Our friend Eric in Idaho, he's on Lake Ponderay. That's when I caught the huge bull trout. Nice. On my Orvis uh, Rocky Mountain 7 foot 5 weight. 34 nice. inch bull trout. Holy, good lord. <laughs> yeah. I was that like, is a big fish. And, and the weird thing was, <laughs> yeah, as he went up in elevation, it was all cutthroat, cutthroat. Cutthroat stopped all bull trout as wow. I was going upstream, which was very bizarre. Usually the fish gets smaller as you go up in elevation. Yeah. 
These things were, I mean, just a meter long. Wow. What other questions do I have? All right, back up to the Eddie Murphy. Any yeah. one of his early like uh, comedy specials, like Raw. I got what? kicked out of Raw. My brother and I snuck into it. Really? Yeah, we must have been eight, nine, eight, nine years old. Th- that was we got like uh, yanked out by our ears. That that th- those are amazing. The outfit he wore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember seeing uh, Beverly Hills Cop in the theater. Oh, it, they must have not just checked I mean, you'll never get that out of your head. No. Ever. I mean, Beverly Hills Cop is oh. great. So, what about with all your traveling, are there good travel hacks on how to pack and what to pack? I know Dan yes. loves the Orvis rod carrier, the square one. Yes, this the square one. So, Dan... Um, Dan I have so much in that right now. It, it's amazing. I have probably it's 60 a, things in mind. So, so... In Orvis, in, in the headquarters, we love to use acronyms. So that rod case is called the Carry It All, or we call it the CIA. Yeah, we're dorks. So the CIA is great. Dan actually made, though, which I think is the coolest thing in the world. Um, so we use a lot of these uh, duffel bags, these rolling duffel bags. And he made, he just went to Home Depot and got this, like, corrugated, it's not PVC, it's lighter than PVC, but it's probably like a four-inch tube, and, and then put a cap on it, and, he'll, and he made it so it'll fit a nine-foot rod, and you can stuff five nine-foot rods in it, so, and, and it's great, and it packs perfectly into the bottom of this, and so, so we have a couple of these tubes, and it's something like you could probably make for like two or three bucks going to Home Depot. That thing is great. I think... Do you know his Paula Dean story? Yes. Okay. Yes, with with the butter knife. Yes. 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 He likes to make things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a brilliant idea. It is an absolutely brilliant idea. A butter knife with the different uh, increments, like you know, a tablespoon, two tablespoons. It was measured. So you could cut a tablespoon or two tablespoons. It was a butter knife. Cheese. My kid and her friends eat on play dates. I'm always like, well, damn, the wife cut it in like an awkward spot. <laughs> but this one. You cut the was, butter crooked. Yeah. Russians. So, um, I think uh, um, it, it, I think it's a brilliant idea, though. Dan, it, I, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. I, so, another travel hack is um, uh, easy on, easy off shoes. Uh, if you don't have pre-check or clear or global entry or anything like that. Or if you sell the yeah. Ariat Spot Hogs. The only shoe I wear. No laces, too. No, yeah. you got, those technically aren't laces, though. You live in New England, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> Just tell by the shoes. So easy on, easy off shoes is important. Make sure your ID is easily accessible. So in my wallet, mine's not. In my wallet where my ID slides into, it's a pain in the butt to take it out and put it in. Make sure you have a way to get it out easily and also... As much as they they suck, all of those apps for American, Delta, Southwest, you name it, United, all of those apps where you can get your your ticket on your phone is amazing. I I, got to say, I I hate the apps, but at the same time, I love them. Having your ticket on there, and they all have a way to track your bag. So if you're checking a bag, oh, absolutely. They'll let you know. You could be sitting on your plane. You can go into that app and say track my bag and it will tell you your bag has been loaded onto the no plane way. they all do it i had no idea you could do that yeah, and some of them will send you notifications on your phone if you now if you're dan Devala though you do not have a cell phone so you don't know this kind of stuff you gotta send a pigeon to him exactly <laughs> or like pick up your tin can and be smoke like, signals or dan something Devala, i have a can of campbell soup your bag is delayed and then he's got like an 80 foot string <laughs> from the plane into the terminal but, but he can get. He's got a skateboard, so he can get around. Yeah, abs- absolutely. So I think uh, I think that stuff is really important. Not really important. Helpful. It's a hack. I think it's a hack, and take advantage of it. I mean, with the technology these days, that makes life so much easier. Um, also, whatever you think you need, you don't need as much. I oh, I I'm so guilty of overpacking. You do not need as much stuff as, as you think you need, but I always pack a pair of underwear into my carry-on. 
an extra pair of underwear, always. Because if they're ruined, you can't turn them inside out and use them again. Exactly. All right. All right, last question. I've never had to end a podcast because my bladder is this full. Uh, what fly should everyone carry with them? Clouds or minnow. There we go. All right, Pete, where can we find you online? Any social medias? Yes. Uh, so on Instagram, it's uh, I'm not on Instagram. Uh, well, I am, but I never am. So I am one of those people who just doesn't use it all that much. Um, it's fish too much um, on Instagram. But I think the best way is uh, is uh, ask a casting instructor at Orvis, you know, Orvis News. You know, contact me through Orvis right or something like that. If you have any questions, last name, first initial at Orvis dot com, um, and uh, I'd be happy to uh, yeah to talk. And a follow up, another last question: Your wife had a good trip on the Roadfish Roadie. She did. She did. So she went down. Uh, it was funny. She was down in Florida that week. I was down in Florida the next week, and we kind of like handed off her daughter in the airport practically. See, my uh, wife was in Paris last week, and I'm in Altmar. It's <laughs> like. <laughs> Polar opposites. Exactly. Um, she uh, she had a great time. Great time on the Redfish Roadie. She was in Stewart. Got to do some fishing. Uh, you know, hung out with Jen and and Heather and and the whole crew. Um, had a great time. And uh, you know, got to got to meet a lot of really really cool people. I mean, it's it's a great thing that they're doing. You know, just trying to get more people in the sport. It's awesome. Last question. Oh my god. Can you give Dan DeVala a wet willy for me when you get back at the office? I will I will try. He's pretty spry, though. All I right. mean, he's, he's a little quicker than I am. Watch out for that beard. Yeah. <laughs> All right. He's got that Thank wizard you, beard. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us for the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. For more information or to contact Rob, please go to www.robsnowwhite.com. This podcast is brought to you by Freestone Productions at freestoneproductions.com.